Welcome to the Green Brother. Welcome everybody to the Berean Brotherhood. God bless you all. We in season two, episode seven, and I'm going to need that lucky number seven with me. Before we continue, I want to thank you all for watching. Hit that subscribe button right there. Thank you for all your support, all your love, all your messages that you send, your encouragement. Today, we're going to be discussing Satanism and the Satanic Bible and how it ended up in my library. I went to Naya College and I started to learn about apologetics. And I thought to myself that it would be a great idea if I were to study all sorts of things that actually happen to own almost every translation of the Bible, except for the Ethiopian and Coptic Bible, right? And I said, what better way to get to know the enemy than by reading some of the things that the enemy is publishing by using his uh, so-called high priest, right? In summer of 2005, I went to visit a Barnes and Nobles and I happened to come across a satanic Bible. And in my love and passion for studying the word of God and studying apologetics and trying to get ahead in, in advanced spiritual warfare, I thought it would be a great idea to see what the enemy's uh, talking about, to see what the enemy has to say. And when I saw the Satanic Bible, I had already owned every other single Bible known. I even had a parallel Bible that had four different translations. So when I saw it, I said, you know what, let me purchase this. Um, but I made a promise to myself. And the promise was that I was not going to read the Satanic Bible until I finished reading the whole entire Bible first. After I finished reading the whole entire Bible, then I said that I would read the Satanic Bible. came to pass that it took a few more years before I read the whole entire Bible. And all along, I've only read the, uh, the first few pages of the Satanic Bible and then the very end of it. And it sat in my library full of all these Christian books that I have. Yep, this, this library right here. It sat in that library for years, and I came across a teaching from Derek Prince, and I was in prayer, and I was in meditation as I was listening to Derek Prince do a deliverance, and I was asking the Holy Spirit to bring to memory anything in any way that I may have offended him in anything that... I may have done that it may have not even I may have forgotten or it didn't cross my mind. And I remember this happened in the pandemic in 2020. I happened to be listening to this video and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit prompted me to look at my bookshelf. When I look at my bookshelf, I have all these Christian books, all these Bibles. And in the center of it, I had the Satanic Bible. And my heart broke for a minute. And I said, you know what? I need to get rid of this. This is not something that is edifying. I do not want to have anything occult in my house. I had had it for so many years. I decided to pray, to repent, to renounce. And I started to rip every single page of the Satanic Bible. As I was praying, I threw it out in the garbage because I didn't want to throw the book out so that somebody else could get their hands on it. I just ripped every single page and I was repenting and I said, Lord, forgive me for even desiring to purchase a counterfeit. Because I realized over the years that you don't need to have to know what the enemy is cooking in his camp. If you know your word of God, then you will be able to identify a counterfeit every single time. Ask anybody that works in finances, anybody that works in the bank with money. In order to tell the true counterfeit, you need to know the original. So I'm so familiar with the word of God. I know it back and forth. And I have a keen ear to hear deception, a keen ear to hear uh, when there's a false teaching. And I thank God for that gift. But the one thing I do remember is that in the Satanic Bible, within that first prologue, first few pages, before you even get into the chapters, um, they had what was called the nine Satanic Statements. And it's outlined in it as a 
basically a book that promotes self-indulgence, self-interest, um, a rejection of traditional morality. And here are the nine statements and a biblical way to refute each and every one of them. Number one, Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence, right? So in the word of God, we know and we understand the importance of enjoying life and all of its pleasures, but it also advocates for us to have uh, moderation, self-control, and to be content, right? First Corinthians 9.25, Galatians 5.22, we understand the importance of moderation and Satan, the adversary, wants us to indulge, doesn't want us to abstain, doesn't want us to uh, uh, refuse these things. And with the promotion of self-indulgence, the promotion of self-interest, it only is self-gratification. And with Christ, there is denial, and then there is power against the works of the flesh and the works of the enemy, right? Number two. Satan represents a vital existence instead of a spiritual pipe dream, right? So for Satanists to claim that they don't believe in a physical entity, but this idea that you can have a vital existence rather than a pipe dream because we believe in God by faith, right? So one of the responses that we can have for that for that second one is that the Bible emphasizes the importance of a relationship with God. It talks about the price that he paid for us to have a relationship with him. But it views a physical existence as only temporary. This tent is not going to be here forever. Tomorrow is not promised. So I'm existing now, but tomorrow may not come. All right. Number three. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical deceit, right? So we understand that the Bible promotes wisdom. We understand that the, the Bible promotes that every single thing that is in the word of God is rooted in truth and in righteousness. And it warns against us being self-deceived and against hypocrisy, right? So we are not self-deceived when we are following the ways of God. When you see the book of Ecclesiastes, when you see that Solomon lived his whole entire life and he indulged in everything that all the possible pleasures of the world, the final conclusion was that it was all not worth it, that there is nothing new under the sun. And at the end of the day, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Number four is Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates, right? And this is funny to me when, when I read this because it's easy to be kind and to love someone who loves you back. Even Jesus said this, right? But the Bible teaches us that we should have agape love and unconditional love and forgiveness even towards our enemies, right? Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Luke chapter 6, verse 35. And it encourages believers to love others as Christ loved them. So it is not weakness for us to love only those um, who love us, right? And who deserve it, right? There are some people that we're going to love that doesn't, that don't deserve it. So, I think we can refute that with the word. Number five, Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. So a lot of these satanic principles are obviously based off of scripture, right? We're midway there. And it basically a biblical response to that is that the Bible advocates for forgiveness. The Bible advocates for reconciliation. And the Bible says that Revenge is mine, says the Lord. So we don't have to take revenge on ourselves. The fact that it's claiming that Satan uh, represents vengeance, it's so clear and cut right there. Number six, Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for physical vampires, right? And basically, 
this is a type of morality that is trying to promote that um, only be kind to those who are kind, like do you as long as it doesn't harm anyone else. And if it does, like it really doesn't matter. Right. Um, And not having concern over your brother, the Bible tells us that we should be concerned about those who are marginalized, those who don't have a voice that we should, uh, fight against our own selfishness and self-centeredness. This is not the way of God. The way of God is to be selfless, to be compassionate, to love, even if that person is ungrateful. Number seven, Satan represents man as just another animal who, because of his divine, spiritual, and intellectual development, Satan represents man. Satan represents a man just as another animal. Because of his divine and spiritual development, he has become the most vicious animal of all. Now, humans in their fallen nature are the apex predator. They're at the top of the list uh, because that's just the way it is, right? But we were called to have dominion. We were called to reign over the world, over the animal kingdom, over the plant kingdom. And we're not just animals with raw instincts uh, using only parts of our brain that is controlling uh, a raw emotion, right? We are spiritual beings. We are physical beings. And we have the ability to do great good. And we also have the ability to do evil. Um, but ultimately, the redemption that Christ offers gives us an ability to be regenerated and to be transformed from the inside out where we're not doing behavior modification, but we're doing things naturally uh, to please the Lord because if it pleases him, it pleases us. Number eight, Satan represents all of the so-called sins as they all lead to physical, mental, and emotional gratification. Gratification is not a sin. We are able to have a fulfilled life in gratification, in pleasure, as long as it's in within the parameters that God has created for us. So anything that's physical, mental, and emotional, these things, as long as it's not in the flesh and in sin, then it will not separate us from God. And this is like one of those things where it's trying to lead on the people to say like, Everything that supposedly feels good or is good is uh, uh, called a sin, which is a lie, right? God gives us healthy covenants, healthy parameters so that we can enjoy uh, and be in delight of what he has created. Number nine, this is the last principle of the Satanic Bible. Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had because he's kept it in business all of these years. The Bible identifies Satan as the enemy of God and the enemy of humanity. First Peter 5, 8 says that he is the source of all temptation and sin, but ultimately he cannot overcome the power of God's love and his grace. This idea that he is the big, the biggest friend or the biggest thing that has kept the church in business all of these years. No, he is being defeated. He can only resist temporarily because God is, it is not a war of, of deity versus deity. Lucifer or Satan, right? Was something that was created. Now let's clarify it, right? God created an angel and then there was sin found in that angel, and he fell from heaven, taking one-third of the angelic uh, council with him. And therefore, they wage war spiritually in the powers, uh, principalities, and rulers that are in the sky, right? Angels have their function, demons or Fallen angels have their function. And a little bit of history on Satanism, according to Anton LaVey, right? 
Um, they use the word Satan not because they believe in a literal being or deity or or sentient being, but they did it because it's a representation of all of the ideals that he was proposing. Um, when he used the term Satan is that he embodied the ideas of freedom, of individuality, of everything that was contrary to organized religion, and it was really used for a shock value. When you say the word Satan, everyone already gets an image in their head of what they think uh, Satan looks like because of the Greek influence over the years. But nonetheless, it was done with the intention to be a symbol to reject people from even having further conversations. And when you really dissect it, when you really look into it, Satanism is just atheism branded up in a way to spook Christians or to spook people. So my encouragement to you is to not be intimidated by anyone that calls himself a Satanist. It is just atheism. And I truly believe that they need love there we could find common ground when trying to have conversations with them for example they believe some of them believe in a spiritual realm some of them um have a boldness in the way that they express their religious uh, uh beliefs even though it's unpopular which it's unpopular for us to even share our religious beliefs right and you know, we could explain that there is no cosmic battle between Satan and God. The Bible clearly tells us that Jesus won it all at the cross. He said it is finished. He will reign for a millennial, uh, a thousand years. And after all is said and done, Jesus won. The battle is won. I want to encourage you all to continue fighting the good fight. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. God bless you all. Peace out.